I'm your host, Chris, along with my man, Dallas. We are here. We are excited. We have a great topic today. We are going to talk about table politics. So I'm very excited about this. This will be very good for you guys entering into very soon to be tournament scene and this is really going to help everybody out a lot so i'm very excited about this one yeah definitely should be a fun topic so where do we want to start today gator <laughs> or chris oh man so uh well you know what let's get that out the way so my nickname is actually gator so if you guys hear dallas say that a few times that's because my name's actually gator yeah. and you know it kind of works out you know being gator bait you know what i mean so but I think where we should start this off is we have to know our role at the table. So topic number one, know your role. When you're sitting down at a table, who are we at the table? Like, what is our exact goal? What is our deck trying to accomplish? Like, so for instance, Dallas, let me hit you with one of these. So if we have Tatiova, we have Malcolm Breaches, we have Gut Leader, and we have Malcolm Dargo. Who's the aggro deck at the table, right? All right. So if we have those four decks at the table, sounds like the two putting on the immediate pressure are going to be Gut and Malcolm Dargo is my guess. Gut, Gut, just going ham, trying to make those skeletons as fast as possible. And then I assume Dargo... A Malcolm Dargo deck is probably less focused on Dargo, but is probably still looking, if it wants to, to put down that Dargo pretty soon. So they're going to be pressuring the life totals. Tatiova is a bit of a slower combo deck, typically, and Malcolm Breaches tends to be a bit grindier. So. so but we have to know like who we are, though, right? So like, if I'm the gut leader player sitting at that table, right, I need to be able to know that I'm the aggressor, I have to start going ham because I'm against three combo decks, right? It's not looking too great for me, but it's not horrible for me either, right? Because these decks come prepared, right? They have the interaction, they have the counter spells, they can keep themselves in check, and including Gut also has the tools to be able to assist with that as well. But I have to, once again, going back, knowing my role, I have to be turning sideways. I have to be pressuring the table to the best of my ability. Now, let's, let's, let's go over to, like we were saying, Malcolm Dargo. Now, I do know that Malcolm Dargo is a little bit of the half-breed, right? It has the combos, but it can be aggressive. So maybe it's dependent on your hand more so with that deck than others. But if you're looking at Gut Leader being the only player at the table pressuring life totals, it may be who of you, right, to assist with that Dargo, right? And kind of almost build the truce with that Gut player, be like, look, I'm also one of the slower decks at the table. You know, we may be able to work together, right? You see where I'm going with these politics? So what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think if you're in that position where you have you are the second most capable combat deck. I think it's fairly important to uh, try to establish that relationship with the other combat player, right? Especially if you're in that specific scenario, Malcolm Dargo with a gut leader at the table, and you can go, hey man, if you're attacking the other players and you build up your skeleton army, my deck doesn't actually play a lot of creatures that are going to want to block, so it's not like you just get blown out for targeting everyone else first, and then you can't get through to me. You can still punch through to me, um, so you don't have to worry about that. Obviously, you know, you still have to worry about combos and all that jazz, but it's not one of those matches where you lose just because no matter who you target, if you go for the combo decks first, you get walled out, and then if you go for the deck that can build the wall you just lose to the combo decks it's kind of important to try to uh, establish that connection and yeah just yeah. take advantage of what you can use all your win conditions yeah definitely right so there, there's so many scenarios where we have to like like tatiova has to know that it is going to be attacked right it's it should know 
that gut is coming for it. So Tatiova has to be that deck at the table going, hey, Malcolm Breaches, uh, you know, I know you play some Rass in that deck, you know, let's, uh, let's kind of take care of these gut skeletons, right? So th there's these weird alliances you can make with your players that maybe these discussions should be brought up because you never know, right? Maybe you can build an ally, you know. There's a lot of different little nuances there between all those things, especially when it comes to, like, these heavy combo matches and then these just incredibly aggressive decks, right? I mean, essentially take one player out by turn five, like, guaranteed, so... People are going to need to be talking unless, you know, Tatiova tries to go off first. But now, you know, we put ourselves into predicament. Do we just go, go fast? Or we're trying to, you know, kind of puts us in a pickle between ourselves. Yeah, and another big reason that uh, focusing on your politicking skills is definitely viable. It's been said by uh, many people before me, but uh, it's... A card that you don't have to pay resources or a card from your hand to play, right? Like, if I can counterspell something by telling someone to throw a counterspell at something, that's that's amazing for me, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, isn't that, like, one of the best things where you kind of look at the table? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I am so happy we have an editor. <laughs> wow. I soaked my shirt. <laughs> Jesus. I wonder if that'll show up. All right, probably. But we'll, we'll go with it. All right, jumping back. Where were we? Uh, what did you say? Get oh, yes. For you. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, isn't that, like just so perfect though the counter spell it when somebody plays something very very threatening right let's say you're the tanti of a player and you're sitting with your graveyard combo in hand and gut decides to play relic or progenitus and you might not have the ability to counter it but you know that the one of the other two players needs their graveyard for like a treasure cruise or something along those lines they've been building up for because you guys were talking about it and you're like whoa this card is really gonna put a damper on that treasure cruise and you kind of deflect it over towards them which makes them kind of think which is kind of kind of fishy there right like you know we're not trying to lie right we're not trying to lie that's the yeah. the biggest part about it <laughs> um Especially with decks like uh, Cormella, Glamour Thief, and uh, commanders that are very graveyard-centric, it's kind of funny to be a deck that has combo lines that utilize the graveyard, or cards like Treasure Cruise, and then cards and combos that don't, because they are so pressured into dealing with every piece of grave hate that comes down, that you can kind of set up graveyard combos and trust that there's double the chances that those grave pieces get interacted with, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There, There's a, a weird dynamic overall, right? Like, when we're sitting down at the table, so the most prominent combo piece we have, right, is good old Peregrine Drake and Ghostly Flicker. So both of those key pieces are, like, I don't know, I, I don't know how to say this, right? Maybe they we could call them, like, the the highest echelon of the combos that we have, right? Like, that's you're going to see that m more than anything you'd ever see in the format, right? So you need to be prepared for it. And so let's kind of let's switch gears, right? Let's, uh, let's give a different example. Let's move on to four different combo decks, right? Let's use... What, what, what do you like to use, Dallas? What are, you, what are you thinking we can hit? But let's do four combo decks. Four combo decks. Okay. Four combo decks. Let's see. I'm thinking um, Gretchen and or Weavers and or Parcel Beast. Any uh, Simic Freed from the real deck, really. Okay. Um, let's go with uh, Malcolm Kedis. Uh, okay. Turbo. So we got two now. Turbo is it deck? 
Let's go. Is it Guild Mage? Another. Ooh, that's a is that's it a good one. Deck? And let's throw in Cormella. Glamour. Cormella. Uh, Grixis. All combo. right. All right. Those are really great examples. Now let's do this. How do we know if we we sit down and we are one of these players? How do we know which one we are? Right. So. If I'm the, is it, or let's say this, I'm the, I'm going to take it from you. I'm going to take it from you. I'm going to be the Simic player this time, right? So I sit down as the Simic player. How do I know my role there? It's four combo decks. Like what, what makes me, we're going to, we're going to go with Gretchen, right? Since it's yeah, the most familiar Gretchen. one. Let's I go with Gretchen. Let's go with Gretchen. We'll, we'll go with Gretchen. Yes. We'll go with Gretchen. So I'm gonna be the control deck at this table am i not or no i am the push uh, your face in combo deck aren't i, I that's gonna be my role i don't think you're either um, really so what I are think, we i think it obviously very much depends on the opening hands if you open turn two turn three win you're going for it um probably not necessarily uh there are every deck at the table has blue and most of them have red, which makes it very scary to try to go for early wins. Um, well, unless they're well, also tapping out to put down their combo pieces. Well, well, let's see. Let's say this though, right? We could almost definitively say Carmela's going to be the control deck, right? Because they're very narrow. They don't have enough pieces. They don't have enough bodies. They don't have enough creatures to really go to town. Yeah, Carmela takes but a lot of setup, so it's very valid to say that they're the control, and they have three colors. So. Yeah, so they're going to be a little bit slower. But I mean, isn't that make Malcolm Kedis the aggressor, right? They are yep. going to be the ones uh, actively pressuring the table, even though they're not an aggro deck, even though they're like the turbo deck at the table. They have the cleanest fall black attacking plane. Isn't that kind of weird? Yeah, right? so Malcolm Kedis kind of has the uh, best enabler for getting those fast wins consistently because they have that massive burst of mana in the command zone, right? And they have access to that yes. at all points in the game. Um, well, they also have the Fire Weaver, right? They they yeah. also have ways to get damage in, right? Where the other decks are kind of just sitting back waiting for their combo. So they could be the pressure at the table, right? They can, but in this table, I'm expecting no one to die to damage. Um, I'm just trying to think of it more in terms of not who does the damage, but more so who's comboing when. Who's mm. making those attempts? Who's going to have the pieces of interaction in their hand? So oh, yeah. the way I see it, the Simic deck, Gretchen in this case, is kind of in the position where you play a bit of a control play style, but more than anything, you want to have one or two counter spells in your hand and just throw out all of your ramp, and just try to draw cards um, until you have enough protection to actually go for your combo. Because it's going to be very unsafe to go for the combo. So if you're the Simic player, you sit and draw until you have the interaction, or until someone else tries to combo, and they get stopped, and you see that other interaction get burnt out. Which is why I think Simic does very well at combo tables. And oh, uh, yeah. is it Guild Mage also gets to do that, especially at this table? Well, that's that's a weird one, right? Because that's kind of like the the what is it? The sword in the mix, right? That's a really weird deck, right? Because if you allow that Guild Mage to resolve, they could run away with that game pretty easily, right? I mean, triple lightning bolts, right? Like the triple counter spells, like it's going to be pretty easy for them to handle everyone, but. It's probably who of all the players to not let them resolve that guild mage, right? But it's, you got to kind of see it's a double-edged sword, you know, you got to figure out if you need it or if you don't kind of thing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of in limbo with Gretchen here, where we have the clear, pretty much guaranteed Malcolm Kedis is probably going to try to win early and win first. And then you have Cormella, who's pretty guaranteed to be trying to win the game after just controlling the board to the point where they get a free win. 
And then Gretchen and Guildmage are kind of in that situation where it's really difficult to tell and exactly why we're talking about this in the first place, right? Yeah, exactly, right? Definitely agree with that, so. I, I, I don't know, man, but, like, isn't it, like... So, I think you have to be the responsible players, though, at the table, too, right? Like, we have to actively understand what has to happen here, right? Like, I have to say, if I'm in front of the Malcolm Kedis player, right, I have to be able to understand, like, they're going to try to probably combo first, and I'm going to be the last one in turn order, but I need to be able to answer them as well. So you kind of have to know who you're trying to answer at all points in time, right? Yeah, you got to make sure you understand what the win conditions of each deck is and understand how close they are to those win conditions. You know, have they been tutoring? Have they drawn cards? Do they have 10 cards in their graveyard? Do they have any sort yeah. of board presence? Do they even have mana in play? Um, there's yeah. so many things you need to keep track of them three other players at all points in time it gets really complicated but but doesn't that bring up the great topic though of this is why we're talking about the politics right maybe you might not know you may not be familiar at all with gretchen but maybe one of the other players is there's nothing wrong with going hey i don't really understand what they're doing over there can you kind of hit me with like the red flags and let me know what's going on if they're getting close or, you know, and see, maybe you could work with those other players and try to understand these yeah. different decks, right? Yeah, I've, I've definitely had games where I've played and I've had people ask me, they're like, so how soon does insert deck win? Um, do we need to be worried? And it's like turn two turn three and i'm like well they have one piece in play let's say it's malcolm let's say it's a malcolm x red deck and they have malcolm and turn two they just dropped a reckless fire weaver it's like if they have the card in hand any card in hand like amoeboid changeling i guess that one doesn't work you need something like trickery charm to do it at instant speed uh, but yes. if they have a way to change the type of that Reckless Fire Weaver to Pirate, they can win right now. Like, yeah. And yeah, if they don't know that combo line, you need to make sure the table is aware to make sure not everyone's tapping out and just giving yeah. a free turn three, turn four win to the Malcolm deck. So that's kind of like, once again, we're falling back to right, knowing your role at the table. And I think it is a bit unknown in our format as a whole and I, I hate to say it like this but i don't believe it's very common knowledge that some of these decks can win as fast as we're saying we're talking about turn three turn four turn five consistently winning games if they're uninteracted so i don't know about your experiences dallas but mine has been a lot like that lately where somebody's like you know i'm i'm here my deck is competitive to to their knowledge right and they're like, yep, tap land, rock, tap land, rock. And they're like, I'll play my commander next turn. And all of a sudden, they just lost the game. And they weren't under the impression that decks could win at this rate of speed in the format, which I think the tournament scene will really kind of open up a few eyes to things of that nature. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, that Malcolm scenario, I was just describing i had a game recently where i just curved into malcolm on turn three and i had reckless fire weaver and trickery charm in hand for turn four and i watched the player after me tap out and then the player after them tap out and i was like wow am i just gonna win on turn four wow. and then <laughs> and then you know luckily the third player had sorcery speed yeah. removal to get rid of the uh, Malcolm, but the Malcolm. regardless, the Malcolm died, and they didn't lose turn 4. And that game went to, like, turn 12 because of that. And it was like, yeah. so, it's kind of scary even when I'm the person playing it, like, just yep. playing with friends and stuff, and I'm like, oh, 
you guys don't realize. Which, like, I also get it because it's just a Malcolm, right? Am I yeah. gonna, like, assume every game that Malcolm on turn three, they're gonna have Reckless Fire Weaver into tr Trickery Charm turn four? Like, that's not really a safe assumption to make, but it's also something you do still need to acknowledge can happen. Yeah, that's kind of like all these combo decks, right? Like, they could win, right? The best hand in Simic is, what, turn two? But, I mean, there's so many pieces that need to be assembled. And then Malcolm is turn... I mean, actually, there's a few people out there doing Turbo Malcolm, so I believe some can win as early as turn three. So, like, we have different variants of these decks, like Abdel Adrian is one as well. That one could win as fast as turn four. So... But that's a, that's a big ask, right? So what we need to really do is understand and come to the table with our interaction pieces. You know, don't go home without them, as I like to say. Or don't leave home without them, as I like to say. Yeah, you so. need to have at least some kind of very efficient interaction, be it, you know, snuff out. it. The life is worth it. I swear, guys. If you want to play Interaction in Black, you should play Snuff Out. Um, I've seen some lists not playing it, and I, I don't really understand that one. Um, okay. Cough, like cough. Thunderclap. Thunder clap. Yeah, exactly. Thunderclap. Thunderclap. Um, Thunder clap. <laughs> mind Collapse. I think Mind Collapse is pretty decent. Um, it's kind of annoying that you can't cast it for free on other people's turns, but it's still free removal at in some capacity. You know, Lightning Bolt, Scred, Vendetta, Curfew even, if you're in blue. Yeah, there's so, there's so many different, uh, just so many different cards we could use for these instances, showing, like, different situational purposes. But let's kind of jump over to this one, Dallas. Um, let's, let's throw another weird scenario out there, right? One deck that I kind of just mentioned and I like to throw out there is Abdel Adrian. Weird. Now, that's been... Well, I'm just throwing the deck out there as a whole. Or just so all let's, Abdel let's do... decks. No, 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 no. Just Abdel itself. So we're uh, specifically we're talking about Abdel Adrian and uh, Sword Coast Sailor. So blue white. Uh, that deck has kind of been like a boogeyman, right? So when people sit down, they kind of point the finger. It's kind of been like the normality of just everyone. Just point the finger at it. Get him dead. And you, we were just talking about, is it right to just do that? Is it right to just do this? We're, we need to have our proper threat assessment. So as an Abdel player, when you sit down, you have to know your role at the table as well. So going all the way back to knowing our role, yes, it's dependent who we're playing against. But when I sit down as the Abdel player, I'm going to go, okay, if there's no aggro deck at the table, I'm the aggro deck. I'm going to apply pressure with my tokens, right? I'm going to be doing these things. What, how does that make you feel? What do you think about that one, Dallas? Um, I think Abdel's, specifically blue-white Abdel, is kind of an interesting one because it can try to be that aggressive deck, but I think Abdel is typically a bit slow. It is. Uh, the, the, st that? the standard builds, yeah. Um, I guess if you're at a table with, like, no combo, then you can just try to play, like, turbo cast Abdel and make a bunch of blockers. Um, oh, I've I been in that situation. Okay. <laughs> I, I've been in a lot of those situations where you just turbo <laughs> out as fast as you can some dudes. But I think, in general, the way that I would want to lean with Abdel is just being that deck that as soon as we hit, like, turn 7, from that point onwards, I am presenting a win every turn. Like, mm. I will cast Abdel. You killed it. Cool. I'll try to cast him again next turn and win. And then I'll try again on turn 9. Um, but you can yeah, also the... play a more conserved and try to hold up some extra mana for counter spells and all that stuff and take a turn off in between, stuff like that. He's just very versatile in that mid to late game, I think, is the way I see yeah. it. Yeah, that card is very, has a lot more 
game dynamic than I gave it credit for originally. And I think the reason that was was because when I first started playing Abdel, it was like the boogeyman that just came out. I'm like, it's, it's new. Why is it the boogeyman already? And everybody just murdered you first, right? You were the first one dead at the table every time you sat down. Even like my local... It was a headline. Like, <laughs> yeah, like like all my local friends, right? Like in person, they're like, oh, bro, we got to take you off the table. I'm like... They're like, bro, you're the World Gorger Dragon player. We have to take you off of this. I'm like, oh. So, like, I definitely get it. I definitely get it. But let's move on, man. Let's, uh, let's do some of our favorite parts. Let's go for the deck of the week. Absolutely. What you got for us this week, Chris? Oh, man. So I got a spicy one, which I'm hoping shows up to the tournament because this is kind of like one of those fringe decks that very very rarely ever sees play in any of the, the discord servers or anything like that and when it shows up it like cleans house because it's one of those weird kind of off the wall decks so this is a dargo the shipwrecker and keleth this deck is a boros deck but it is dude this deck is nuts right so it's red white it uses the white to protect dargo but it also is a double strike deck. So it just one shot a player at a time. And th the goal of this deck is to go turn two Dargo consistently. So it's like at a, I think it's like a 72% turn two Dargo. Like the way it's able to cast Dargo on turn two, it's just, it's so efficient at casting Dargo. It's so frightening <laughs> to play against because you're like, are they attacking me? I hope they're not, right? Like, so you're just kind of worried the whole time. And then you're like, I need spot removal. But it's like, oh no, Dargo is a five butt. What do we do? And the other interesting dynamic, if I could throw this at you, is what you get from Keleth is the 1-1 one, one counter on turn three, which makes Dargo with no other spells a two-shot. Which I find to be awesome so what, what do you think about this it, it, are you sold a little bit i know you don't um, like it turning sideways i so. do not like attacking but i have seen this deck played a fair bit and the just the single counter on dargo can really make it a threat especially if there if there is one combo deck at the pod it's very rough to be that one combo deck Unless you're, like, exactly Gretchen, and you cast Gretchen on turn two to block Dargo, um, you're in a lot of trouble. Because, yeah, if Dargo comes down turn two, turn three, kill it, they punch you for eight. Turn four, you still don't have a way to block two damage. You're, well, yeah, you have to be able to block at least two damage. And if you haven't done that, uh, you're dead. It sucks to yeah. suck. Um, <laughs> yep. Not and there's mention, so many there's ways. There's so many white protection spells that you can play in this deck to just protect Dargo from removal after they take out the first target. And then they just start plowing over all of your blockers. They have time to find that double strike spell and get the mana. They have time to hold up those protection spells. I think the deck's pretty solid. Yeah, this is a... Uh... This deck's pretty wild, man. Like, I have to also say, too, the one thing that I've seen this deck do in playtesting and kind of running through some hands and whatnot with the deck is Heleth kind of sits back, hidden, behind the Dargo, and it eventually becomes terrifying. It's one of those weird cards where it's just sitting there. It's like, oh, I'm a 1-1. One, one. Okay, now I'm a 2-2. Two, two. Now I'm a 3-3. Three, three. And if they finally do deal with the Dargo... All of a sudden, you're like, okay, here's my 5-5. Five, five. I'll give this thing double strike. And they're like, wait. Oh, no. Like, <laughs> like, this came out of nowhere. That's not good for me. So this deck really has a lot of really good redundant pieces. It's fast, and I think it gets a job done. Yeah, that's a play pattern that I've seen with uh, Ezior and Keleth as well, where it's just the mm -hmm. blue-white version of this deck where instead of getting the guarantee just I'm gonna kill someone on turn three and red, you get evasion and protection for your two commanders. And yep. you just kind of 
have seven counter spells in your hand at all times. Um, yep. But even against like tables where you're not swinging with Kellet, it can still sit back and once you've got one or two counters off Dargo, it's not a big deal to just chump block with Kellet. So yeah. he's got some value there too, but yeah, definitely. So I, I like the deck. You know that'll be down in the the description below. You guys definitely give it a look at. This is one that I think if it shows up to the tournament, it's going to be turning some heads and be very threatening at the table. Yeah, dragon spread, dragon breath is uh, an enchantment, and dragon scales. You get to play both because turns out Dargo yes. is good. Uh... <laughs> yes, Dargo is good. So, all right, guys. So now we're back, and we're uh, going to be kind of switching roles, switching a little bit here with our new topic. So, all so you'll see this a lot with uh, me and Dallas. All of our topics kind of intertwine with each other, and it, it, that's what makes it such great conversations that we have because it's not like one, two, three, four. It's like one is four, and four is one, and two and three, and they all kind of like are all conglomerated all together, which works out fantastic for us. Um, but I have to say, going back to the politics, one thing that I think is very important is to know if you don't have those skills. I think you should be true to yourself and say, guys, I'm not good at this, which kind of makes you have to pick a certain deck. What do you think about that, Dallas? I think that's got some viability to it um i think if you're one of those people then you should probably be playing a deck that is uh very linear in its goals like dargo kedis or a just very linear combo deck that doesn't try to interact too much that or you just take the fact that sometimes you'll get played by the other players at the table and you trust them to help you with your threat evaluation and understanding what's happening. Yep. I mean, it's also too, doesn't it fall back into that sometimes you could withhold that information, right? You could just say, somebody tries to point you in direction and you're like, I've seen some people in the past be rude. And I think since we all could just respect each other, right? We could all just say, uh, no, thank you. I'd rather not, you know, give that information. You know, because we are kind of playing for, you know, this is a tournament, right? There's money on the line and prize support and whatnot. So I will say that some, it's not wrong to not use your politics, right? Like, like those skills. You could just let it go and be that guy at the table that doesn't say a word. Yeah, that's usually uh, the person I'll turn into uh, whenever I'm playing a combo deck and I'm, like, close to comboing, and, uh -oh. like, no one else is at that point, and it's just, like, so blatantly obvious that I'm the problem, I'm not gonna argue with you. I'm not gonna lie. I'm just gonna sit there and let people try to figure out what the actual problem is. Because sometimes yep. they know I'm the threat, but they can't figure out what they need to deal with. Or I'll have a secondary combo line at hand or something like that and they deal with the wrong thing, and you just sit there and let it happen. So I got two weird, weird cards for you here. So we have a Jetaxian Probe, and we have Peak. I was going to bring those up. <laughs> so yeah. Yep. So those, I like to call those the training wheels of my blue decks. Whenever I'm trying to learn a deck, I slot those two cards in every time. There's a few others in the format. But those two specifically, I slot them in, and I'm able to see what you got going on. Because that little bit of knowledge knowing somebody's hand goes a long way, including, tell me if I'm wrong, I may give the information to the rest of the table. So with that, we kind of are allowed to almost point the finger. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's not a legal game action for you to tell them to actually show everyone if they don't want to, uh, because it does say, look, they do not reveal. Um, Correct. But, and therefore, you know, 
people sometimes have trust issues with these cards and they're like, oh, you're lying. But like recently in that same game where I was going for a turn four Malcolm win, I played Gitaxian Probe on a Parcel Beast and I saw that they had full combo in hand and two counter spells. I was like, okay, okay, guys, <laughs> they're going to be winning in a turn or two, and they have two pieces of interaction. Yep. We need to find interaction and hold up the mana to actually deal with this. This is a yep. problem. And uh, they did not win off of that, uh, I would say, in large part because of that. So absolute knowledge of a player's hand is some of the strongest things that in the game, in my opinion. Absolute knowledge is king. So, I definitely agree with that, Dallas. I 100% agree with that. But I also like to throw out there, once again, it's like you were talking about Dargo Kedis, where it's like something very linear along those lines. I really like those even for a little bit experienced players, even if you haven't played in a tournament setting in a while. So you can just slot those in, and when you get to these events, you're able to kind of like have your training wheels and kind of be like, okay, the, they have this at me. Okay, now it lets you kind of flow a little bit easier, even though, and I hate to say it this way, that might not be the best card for that slot in your deck. You may be shorting yourself a piece of interaction or something along those lines, but it gives you a fantastic political tool. I mean, I think that's why we're talking about cards like Gitaxian Probe and Peak instead of a card like, uh, what's it called? Urza's Glasses, Glasses of Urza, whichever it's called. Um, Ooh, yes. The thing about Gitaxian Probe and Peak is that they replace themselves. They draw a card, they're instant, well, Peak is instant speed. Um, they're very efficient mana wise. Cataxian Probe is zero mana. I mean, come on, that's almost free information aside from the two health, whatever. But they replace themselves, so you're not giving up that much for this information. And they're very easy to slot into decks, I feel, especially if you're a combo deck. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. So let's let's go over to now this linear option that we started discussing about let's kind of dive into that dallas because i'd like to kind of give people a few different options for that because i think it'd be helpful from us since this is what we're doing right to kind of point people that some people do get nervous right i've been nervous in the past at events and things of that nature so my political skills may not be you know they may be subpar right so I need to play to my strengths, and I think that kind of brings us all the way back to Dargo Kedis, right? That's a very linear deck, very simple, very to the point. I don't need any threat skills, like, right? Just none. Just do the thing, attack, right? And I find there will be a lot of combo decks in the format that can also play that game. And you kind of touched upon Abdel, where you were like... I'm just going to go for it. I'm just going to go for it. I'm just going to go for it. I kind of think there's a few decks in the format. What do, you, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think in general, if this is the kind of deck you're looking for, um, I think similar to some other formats, a great place to start your search is monocolored decks, monocolor commanders. I think they tend to be very straightforward in terms of their strategy. As well as the fact that you don't have to worry about mana bases, you don't have to worry about playing a bunch of tapped lands, your card pool selection is narrowed down for you. But I think there are just a lot of monocolor decks that are very efficient and very straightforward, especially a lot of those combat decks. Like, uh, there's Dargo Kedis. You could play Storm Kiln Artist as like a Storm kind of combo op deck. There's... But we also have Loyal Subordinate. Yeah, that's a that's a newer one. The Mono Black. Black Lightning Bolt. Yeah. Yeah. But we, yeah, it's with Scholar of Ages is another very linear combo deck. So there's a yes. lot of options out there for players that are very 
smooth, clean, and to the point, which I think is very important to throw out there, right? Because if I'm the scholar of Aegis player, I'm just going to sit back, do my thing. I don't have to talk to anybody. I may or may not have a counter spell. All I need is my good old high tide. And there we go. Uh, Going for it. I think when you're in mono blue, you do still have to do some politicking because people are going to see you and go, mono blue. So you have even fewer cards to try to reason your way out of playing fewer counter spells. You should have a counter spell in your hand at all times. Um, yeah. So I think they will rely on you more if you're playing a mono blue deck to have that interaction. Or if you're playing mono black, they're probably going to rely on you to have that removal. I um, could see that. I could see that. But yeah, it's still easier than, uh, you know, being the grixis deck and they're like oh so you have all the counter spells and all the interaction and all the great hate and you're gonna and all the everything spells. right like <laughs> yep 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 i could definitely see that like oh you have the pyroblast and you have the hydroblast man you got a ball <laughs> but no let's uh yeah that's a different one i i it's kind of weird to me thinking about it right because these monocolor decks are very the simplicity about them is fantastic, which I would highly recommend newer players to go into tournaments with something along those lines to start. Even if your favorite deck is Gretchen, or even if your favorite deck is, you know, Cormella, that that's your favorite style, but you're just, you kind of are your own speed bump, right? You kind of can't get over that small hurdle. So you just need to play something that's a little smooth, give yourself a nice transition, and get to know the tournament scene. Another thing that's worth considering if you're looking for a simple deck, I would say, is how many game actions do I have to take on average to end a game, or even just in a turn? How many times do I have to search my deck for a certain CMC or a certain card type, all that stuff? Um, how well do I really have to know my deck? Obviously, no matter what deck you're playing, you're going to need to know your deck to some extent. But mm -hmm. with a deck like Targo Kedis, there's like one, two tutors maybe. Um, and you're just kind of playing cards off the top of your deck. You're just casting Dargo as soon as possible. That's That's the deck, right? Um, whereas some of these other decks, especially Demir combo decks, you are going to be drawing at least one or two tutors a game uh, pretty consistently, as well as needing to know what to counterspell, what to deal with, and they tend to be a bit slower, so they have to really understand the game. You you did bring up one of uh one of the other topics and one of the other points I wanted to touch on, Dallas. So good job, good job, you got us there is the tutors of the format the tutors of the format are very what's the word i'm looking for they're very difficult to use in your they're very politics. conditional well they're conditional but you're showing the table what you're getting and yeah so there's yep. there's no hiding right that you can't hide when i'm like i'm gonna use my dizzy spell yeah, because and they're conditional, show you, high tide. you have to reveal what you're tutoring because we don't have demonic tutor yep. and stuff like that. So, Yep, which essentially goes on to going, okay, guys, we know there's high tide right there. We know they have it. So that really hurts like you as a player, right? If you're just consistently revealing everything to your opponents on your own accord. So I would definitely have uh, certain thoughts about that if uh, how you are as a player before you just jump in headfirst to a Demir deck. For sure. Yeah, I've had times where like I'll tutor for an enchantment or a 3 CMC card in Gretchen and I will not grab Freed from the Real. I'll just grab like a land enchantment. And for a lot of people, that just makes them immediately go, oh, he already has Freed from the Rio in his hand. Uh, the game's yep. over. And I'm like, no, I have nothing in my hand. I have one other card in my hand, and I am just trying to get some mana so that I can dig with my commander. Um, and it, it 
makes a really weird dynamic sometimes when people do know your deck and then you don't tutor what they expect you to tutor. It can create some weird political dynamics there as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's it's our tutors are very difficult as a whole in the format because it's the free information is so relevant and sometimes you end up in is it decks specifically. I've ended up using Muddle the Mixture to tutor for an it charm. And now everyone at the table is going to bully my it charm. They're going to be like, counter the spell. Counter the spell. So you get into these very weird plays with the table to where, like, okay, we know they have that, but can I fight through it? Or is somebody else going to fight through it? So, like, the knowledge of the counter spells and things of that nature are really important for your politics overall. That's that's a, a fun one to kind of dig a little deeper into, I think. Um, what about those scenarios where there are open open knowledge of counter spells in someone's hand? How do you go about playing that if you're the aggressive deck or the control deck or the combo deck that's just trying to sit there and wait for someone else to win first? So let's let's move over to, like... Muddle, we'll use that as the same example. So we muddle the mixture, and we get Counterspell. So a great political tool I would like to throw out there is I've seen the fear of the Counterspell, where I go get Counterspell, and the next player doesn't want, doesn't want to be the player that takes the Counterspell, so they don't do what they want to do. And then same with the next player, and then the same with the next player. So it's like the fear of your getting the counter spell is helps you even build momentum. But we could also flip that, right? Mm-hmm. We could have the opposite thing happen to where they're like, hey, they played something, you need to counter that. Hey, this is gonna win the game, and you're gonna be the first one people point at because they know you have the counter spell. Yeah, I think when you're tutoring counter spells, there's kind of some give and take where it's like people will try to force you to use it, most likely. But also, if there's, like, three other combo decks at the table, it's probably better that you have it. Um, oh, yeah. Because <laughs> you're going to have to use it. Um, and I think it's kind of the same as one of my favorite cards, Aether Spellbomb, against those combat decks or those Simic Freed from the Real decks, where it's like, I have uncounterable bounce in play right now. And it's really interesting to see the table dynamic where some players are just way too afraid of the Aether Spellbomb and refuse to play into it. Some people are extremely overzealous, and they're like, I can't win when that's in play. I'm going to make you pop it. And then they make you pop it, and then you lose to the next player in turn order because you didn't have uncounterable bounds in play. Yep. It, it's a really hard one to navigate because no one wants that in play, but sometimes it's a necessary evil. Oh yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. It, it, that is a necessary evil. There's a few cards that fall into that parameter, right? Like Executioner's Capsule, that's another awesome yeah. card that sees very little play. All the capsules, all the spell bombs, to some extent. Some of them are just bad, you shouldn't extent. play them. But, like, <laughs> in general, that's the effect that they have on the politics game. Oh, yeah. Definitely, definitely. So, I mean, I think that's kind of all we got today. Dallas, you got anything else to, to hit us with? or No, I think that just about covers it. Well, take us on home then, man. All righty. Thank you guys for watching today, listening, however you're viewing. If you want to go ahead and leave a like or subscribe, Subscribe to us on Spotify if that's where you're listening. Leave comments down below if you have any more questions or any thoughts on the episode. You can contact us on Twitter. Links to that in the description. And hope you all had a great day. We'll see you all next time.